Peter Jackson's film adaptation of The Lord of the Rings is known as one of, if not the most, iconic fantasy film trilogy ever made, tying the record for the most Oscars won and becoming an instant classic, known for its amazing writing, acting, and innovative technologies. But as I was watching the Two Towers movie and reading the book, I noticed two scenes that were drastically different from Tolkien's version. Things like Treebeard taking Merry and Pippin to the White Wizard never happened. Frodo falling into the dead marshes made up for the movie. And maybe the most impactful change of all, Gollum's character development as Frodo calls him Smeagol and bonds with him as a fellow ring bearer. This is a Jackson special and is totally flipped around for the film adaptation as Tolkien's version tells a very different story. So then the question becomes, which version is better? Can both work independently in their mediums, or should Jackson have stuck closer to Tolkien's original version of events? Well, I'll leave that up to you. My name is Gibby, and welcome to episode 24 of Movies vs. Manuscripts, Lord of the Rings Edition. This is the show where I analyze Peter Jackson's trilogy, movie by movie, scene by scene, and compare it to Tolkien's original book series to find every difference. Today, we are covering Merry and Pippin's near-death experience in Fangorn Forest, and their first encounter with Treebeard, as well as Frodo, Sam, and Gollum's trip through the Dead Marshes. Buckle up, because there's a lot to cover. And after you've heard all of these changes, I want to hear from you in the comments on whether or not you prefer this film version of events, or if Jackson should have stuck to Tolkien's work. And speaking of comments, shout out to this commenter. Each week, I select one of my favorite comments from a previous episode to feature in my video, so make sure to share your thoughts down below when you're done watching. Also, subscribe if you haven't already, as I release new episodes of this series each Saturday. We've already completed The Fellowship of the Ring, so check out the series playlist to get caught up with all the episodes you might have missed so far. Per usual, I'll cover all the changes across the four categories of character timeline, location, and plot. But first, let's recap what happens in these scenes of the movie. Picking up from where we left off last week, Merry and Pippin have just run into Fangorn Forest and are trying to escape Grishnak, who somehow is still walking around even though he has a spear sticking out of him. After realizing that the orc is hot on their trail, they climb up a tree to run away, but Grishnak gets a hold of Merry's foot. Pulling him to the ground, Merry is about to get stabbed when the tree Pippin climbed comes alive. Its eyes open and it steps forward, squashing the orc under its massive trunk-like feet. After picking up the two hobbits, it says that it thinks they are orcs, despite them both shouting that they are hobbits. The large tree man then says that the white wizard will know, and after some walking, plops them down in front of a glowing white figure who we can't see the face of. And the scene cuts right as Merry and Pippin look up to the so-called white wizard. Now we see Frodo, Sam, and Gollum as they have finally made it out of the rocky Emin Muil and are heading into the dead marshes. We get a brief scene of them walking, with Gollum telling them that he knows a way that orcs don't use. Then we cut to them resting and eating some lembus. Gollum says that he is starving and tries eating a worm as a disgusted Sam and Frodo watch. Frodo throws him a small piece of lembus, and as soon as Gollum tries to consume it, he begins coughing as the bread is too dry and Gollum acts like a little toddler throwing a temper tantrum. He then has a small heart-to-heart -heart with Frodo, but before he can get too close, Frodo tells him to get away. We then cut as they continue through the marshes and little flames pop up around them. They look into the water and see dead bodies and faces, and Gollum explains that there are orcs and men and elves who fought in a battle long ago in these lands. Frodo then looks at one for too long and falls into the water. After he falls in, the body isn't there, but rather the water is much deeper than he thought, and he can see many ghost-like shapes with freakish faces looking at him and reaching for him. Thankfully, before he can drown, Gollum pulls him out of the water and saves his life. Finally, we switch to the last part of the journey through the marshes, as the two hobbits sleep at night and Gollum is crouching a few feet away talking to himself. Frodo overhears him and goes up to him to confront him with his true identity. He calls Gollum Smeagol, and we can see a distinct change come over him, as no one has called him by his real name in ages. Then before they can bond any further, they hear a shriek, and after Sam wakes up, the three travelers cower under a bush as a flying Nazgul sweeps overhead, searching the marshes for any signs of wanderers. Eventually, the Nazgul flies away and Frodo regains his strength and they continue on. And that is where our scenes cut off for this week. There's plenty to cover, so let's waste no time and jump right into our first three categories of characters, timeline, and location. First, for characters, we have a couple of key changes. Number one is that Grishnak is dead, but the movie keeps him for this opening scene. Two, Treebeard's appearance is much different in the book. I really enjoy Peter Jackson's visual interpretation in the movie, however, Tolkien describes Treebeard as much more man-like. Here's a small portion of Tolkien's description. 
quote, a large man-like, almost troll-like figure, at least 14 foot high, very sturdy, with a tall head and hardly any neck, unquote. Tolkien also notes that he has seven toes on each foot and smooth brown skin. The smooth brown skin part is really what stands out to me. I think Tolkien wanted a distinction between the trees and the Ents, whereas Jackson's version makes Ents so similar to trees that Merry and Pippin climb Treebeard without noticing he's not a tree. Lastly, our third character change is Gollum's name. Frodo calls him Smeagol for the first time in the chapter before this one, when they first capture him. We'll cover this more in the plot changes as it heavily impacts the overall narrative, but I also consider it a character change as throughout the entirety of this chapter, Gollum refers to himself as Smeagol, but the movie doesn't showcase this until later. Now let's move on to our timeline changes. There's a distinct difference in the book between their times of travel. I consider this a timeline discrepancy, but it factors into the plot as well. In the book, Gollum hates traveling during the day, so technically they only travel at night. It is reversed in the movie as the walking scenes we get show them in the light, albeit cloudy, marshes, and their sleeping scenes are very clearly at nighttime. Not sure why this was changed for the movie, but oh well. Lastly, we have location, but hey, it's an easy one this week as there are no changes. I guess you could argue that Merry and Pippin walk a lot farther up the Entwash before meeting Treebeard in the book, but in the movie, you can't really gauge how far they have run into the forest before getting caught by Grishnak. So it's all a wash for me. Now, before I head into our final category of plot changes, I just want to remind you that if you're looking for someone to cover all the lines of dialogue that are different or shared between the book and movie, I just can't do that. But I'll do you one better. Check out the link in my description and claim a free trial on Audible, which can get you up to two free audiobooks. You can listen along with me each week and hear the dialogue for yourself, and it supports the channel at the same time. All right, let's dive into the changes. So as you might have picked up, there are kind of two halves to this week's episode. First, Merry and Pippin's side of the story, and second, Frodo and Sam's perspective. I wish I could have done a whole episode just on Treebeard, but sadly, Peter Jackson breaks up their interactions with him into like six different scenes throughout the whole movie, so their involvement is going to be quite sporadic in this series. That being said, there are still some crazy changes made, even in this short moment in this week's video. So let's start with them. The first change is that no orc chases the hobbits into Fangorn. Obviously, as you know from last week, and from the character differences this week, Grishnak is dead. In the book, the spear that impales him kills him officially, whereas Jackson adds a moment of fear in this scene as the bloodied orc nearly catches and kills our two halflings. Thankfully, Treebeard is there to save the day. But that brings up the question of, how did Merry and Pippin actually meet Treebeard if an orc wasn't chasing them? Well, the first noticeable difference is that they don't climb him. Here's what actually happens in the book. After Merry and Pippin escape, they run and walk for a while through the woods, following the stream of the Entwash westward and up towards the mountains. Finally, after a long journey and after their fear of orcs has died away, they rested and took a drink from the stream. They talked with each other, wondering how they would get out, and decided that if they needed to, they could simply follow the stream back out of the forest. However, they seemed to be having trouble breathing and everything seemed dark and dim. After talking for a bit, in typical Hobbit fashion, about their homes back in the Shire and their relatives and Old Bilbo's tale of Mirkwood, they decided to continue on as a stream of sunlight finally broke through the trees. They only had about five days of Lembus left and they knew it. Sadly, after journeying on towards the light, it disappeared once again and Pippin remarked that it was a pity the sun went away as he was almost starting to like the place. Suddenly, a strange voice came from behind them saying, almost felt like you liked the forest, that's good. Then they felt large knobby hands grab them and lift them from the ground as a strange voice said that he would like to turn them around so he could have a look at their faces. And this is how they encounter Treebeard. Another small change in regard to this introduction, by the way, is that Treebeard tells them that he has many names, like Fangorn, but they can call him Treebeard. This is super interesting, as we learn in the book that Fangorn Forest is literally named after this Ent. Now, another change in regard to their first meeting with Treebeard is that he doesn't think they are orcs, specifically because of their voices. However, he does say that if he hadn't have heard their kind speech, he would have mistaken them for little orcs. In the movie, they play this up big time, building the suspense that Treebeard is taking the halflings to Saruman, the White Wizard but in the book, he is confident that they aren't orcs. However, he doesn't know what they are. He goes on singing his rhyme, which helps him remember all the races of Middle-earth, and when hobbits are left out, Pippin tells him that he can add a line about them, which goes like this, half-grown hobbits, the whole dwellers. Now, there's a lot more to cover with their interaction with Treebeard, but I can't go into all of it right now, and a lot of it will get discussed during later scenes with these characters. For now, there are just a couple more changes in regard to Merry and Pippin's involvement this week. First, Treebeard doesn't take them to Gandalf. In fact, Gandalf doesn't meet up with them until after they have attacked Isengard in the book. 
Second, Mary is afraid that they're about to meet Saruman in the movie. As Treebeard says, the White Wizard will decide if they are orcs or not. Like I said already, this builds suspense for the movie, but in the book, Merry and Pippin aren't fully educated on who Saruman even is. This comes up more in a later conversation the halflings have with Treebeard, which we won't dive into this week, but for now just know that they don't really know who Saruman is at this point. Okay, so now let's switch on over to our other two halflings as they journey through the marshes with Gollum. The first change is that the movie omits Gollum's song at the beginning of the chapter in the book. As they're heading into the marshes, Gollum has a much more cheery attitude and sings a song that we hear a version of later on in the movie. This song gives a lighthearted feeling to the beginning of the chapter, as Gollum sings about a nice juicy fish. Sadly, this is removed from this part of the film, as they skip straight to their struggles in the marshes, and the later version of the song we get isn't even very accurate to the real lyrics but we'll cover that when we get there. Next, we have a small line change. When Gollum says orcs don't use it, orcs don't know it, as he is telling them about the path through the marshes, this is actually pulled from the previous chapter. Soon after catching Gollum, Frodo tells him to take them to Mordor, and Gollum admits that he does know a path that the orcs don't know and don't use. Per usual, I can't go through every line spoken because we'd be here all day, but this is one I caught pretty early on, so I figured I had to mention it. Now, the movie cuts to them resting as they eat some Lembus and Gollum cries about being famished. Although this famished line is pulled from the book, the nature of this rest stop is much different. First, Frodo offers Gollum food right from the get-go, and this is what triggers him to freak out about being hungry. In the movie, it takes Frodo and Sam seeing Gollum eat a worm in order for Frodo to offer him some Lembus. Also, Gollum never eats a worm, although this is inspired from a later part of the chapter. At one point, Gollum goes away to find food for himself, and when he returns, Sam can see him chewing on something. Sam then thinks to himself that he doesn't want to know what he is chewing on, and probably thinks that it's worms or beetles. Next, before Gollum tries the Lembus, he throws a temper tantrum about it being from elf country. In the movie, he doesn't know what it is and acts like he nearly chokes on it. This is accurate to the book, as he does eventually nibble on the bread, but before he does that, he sees the Malorn leaf wrapping the bread and smells it too. His face then contorts, and he cries out that he can smell the stinky leaves from the elf country. Similar to the rope, Gollum is not a fan of anything elf-related. Lastly, for this eating moment, Gollum is shown getting close to Frodo and almost having a heart-to-heart -heart with him, but in the book, this never happens. Now we see our three travelers walking through the midst of the dead marshes, and flames pop up around them. This is all very similar to the book, honestly, and might be one of the more accurate representations of a scene so far in this series. The only difference, of course, is the omission of some context we get from Gollum. In the book, he says that the dead marshes contain orcs, men, and elves from a battle long ago when he was young and before he found the precious. Sam then mentions that that must have been an age ago, and asks how they can still see the dead faces now, saying that they must be some sort of dark magic or devilry. Gollum then says that he doesn't know, but he does share that he tried touching them once and couldn't so they physically can't be there. This is accurate to what we see in the movie, as when Frodo falls in, he doesn't fall onto a body, but rather sees a hell-like underworld with ghosts and spirits floating around. So this makes sense that what we see above the water is not what is under the water just like Jackson shows in the movie. But that brings on another change, which is that Frodo never falls into the marshes and Gollum never rescues him. In the movie, this is a crucial plot point that builds trust between our three travelers, and even trust between the audience and Gollum. It makes you think that he is slowly changing, or that he is simply holding to his promise. But in the book, Tolkien makes it clear that this part of the journey was extremely difficult, and they would fall face first into the marshes time and time again, so that by the time they were ready to rest, they were soaked from the neck down. In fact, the only comparable line in the chapter to this moment in the movie is the very first time it happens, and it happens to Sam, not Frodo. The way that we get introduced to the dead faces in the marshes is because Sam falls down into the bog, nearly going under. With his face just inches away from the water, he sees the faces, and we get our dialogue from the movie in which Gollum explains who the faces are. So in reality, Frodo doesn't come close to having an experience anything like what the movie shows. So now the movie cuts to them at nighttime, as they're meant to be sleeping, and then the last part of the scene shows them cowering in fear as the Nazgul flies overhead. This is a bit out of order from what the book has, and these two scenes are drastically changed for the film. In the movie, we see Frodo stroking the ring, and Gollum being Gollum, a few feet away from the hobbits as they sleep. As Gollum is talking to himself, Frodo confronts him with his name, Smeagol. There are multiple changes to this moment in the book, so I'm going to try to do this in the best order possible. For starters, it is actually Sam who overhears Gollum talking to himself. 
Second, this means that Frodo never actually confronts Gollum with his name. If you remember, as I already mentioned, Frodo confronted Gollum with his name Smeagol way back when they first captured him. Since that moment, Gollum has been calling himself Smeagol and been in pretty good spirits. Additionally, a small change is that this means Frodo wasn't awake stroking the ring. Plus, as I mentioned, these two moments are out of order, because in the book, they actually see the ring wraith flying overhead before they go to sleep for the night. And this impacts this scene quite significantly. Here's how things really went down. As they're continuing on their path, we have a brief funny moment of Gollum telling Sam that he stinks, and then our companions travel onward. However, Sam and Frodo notice that something more than stinky hobbits is making Gollum uneasy. Suddenly, all three of them halt in their tracks, stiffen, and listen as they hear a high-pitched wail of a Nazgul cry. They look in the distance and see a winged creature taking off from where Mordor is. Gollum would not move, and he stood shaking and mumbling to himself. In fact, similarly to how we see Frodo react in the movie is how Tolkien described Gollum's reaction. As the winged figure got closer, all of them fell forward and weren't able to get up until the creature left. Tolkien writes that once it left, Frodo and Sam got up, rubbing their eyes like children wakened from an evil dream. They both had to rouse Gollum as he lay on the ground stunned, and once he awoke, he wailed about the wraiths, obviously terrified of them. So all of that being said, here is the defining shift in the narrative. You see, in the movie, Gollum is uneasy and then turns into a more lively and jolly version of himself after Frodo says his name during this nighttime scene. But in the book, it is actually completely flip-flopped. Gollum was doing great, being on the Smeagol side of his personalities for their whole journey through the marshes, and it isn't until the wraith flies overhead that he reverts back to his Gollum self. You see, like I said, these events are out of order in the book, and we actually get the night of them sleeping with Gollum talking to himself after the wraith flies overhead. Essentially, after Gollum has his panic attack and is reminded of the horrors of Mordor, he reverts back to Gollum, and that night Sam overhears him plotting to kill the hobbits and take the ring. His two personalities are fighting with each other, as Smeagol doesn't want to hurt them, but Gollum is convincing him. We hear things like her referring to Shelob, and other lines that Peter Jackson sprinkles throughout the other scenes in the movie. But in reality, this conversation happens very early on in their journey, right here in the marshes. In the movie, Jackson saves these moments for after Gollum feels betrayed by Frodo when Faramir captures him. Now, to go back to the book version, surprisingly, Sam doesn't confront Gollum, but just tucks away this information in his mind and is wary of the creature from that point on, even more than he had been before. The conversation ends as Gollum goes to wring Frodo's neck as he sleeps, and Sam realizes that he doesn't have the energy to fight Gollum, so he just yawns loudly and asks what time it is, stopping Gollum from going any further with his plan to kill Frodo in his sleep. So now that we've covered all of those changes, I just wanted to mention how I really enjoy this version of Gollum in the book. Similarly to how Sam notices Frodo struggling more and more as they get closer to Mordor, Gollum is having a similar effect as he is also bound to the ring. The Nazgul itself isn't necessarily what made Gollum go back to his evil self, but rather it was a reminder of how close they were getting to Mordor, how close they were getting to bringing the ring to Sauron and how close they were getting to potentially destroying his precious. I like to think that so far during their journey, Gollum had stayed cheerful and on his Smeagol side because he was ignorant of the situation. Ignorance is bliss after all. He could ignore what was happening. But as soon as a Nazgul flew overhead, he was struck with the reality and the weight of the situation. His precious was being taken directly to the enemy, and he might lose it forever. It is strange to me how this is flipped completely for the movie, and how Peter Jackson decided to show him being grumpy through the marshes all the way up until Frodo says his name, and then he becomes happier and more Smeagolish. But enough of what I think. What do you think about these changes made for the movie? Now that you've heard all the changes, it's time to let us know if you believe the movie did it justice, or if Peter Jackson should have stuck to Tolkien's lore. Let me know in the comments below. As always, be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and check out the series playlist to catch up on any episodes you might have missed so far. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next episode.